In one week, I will be running the California International Marathon, so I thought it would be good to talk about pacing strategy. Hey guys, I'm Jane, just checking back in with some California International Marathon training and prep as I taper. I did a video a few weeks ago where I was very much in the thick of training, feeling a little bit overwhelmed. It's been really good since then. I'm getting really excited, enjoying this taper now, coming off of several 50 plus mile weeks. Last long run of this training cycle. Got 15 miles. Be light in about 30 minutes. And I'm feeling ready. So in that last video, I had a subscriber, Jim Allen. Thank you for the request. He asked for just pacing advice and overall strategy for the race. So I thought that was awesome and I would love to share that with you all for anyone who's running the California International Marathon or really anyone who just wants marathon training advice in general. This will be applicable because it's always my goal to be able to help you all with your racing and your training. So this is the first video in a three-part series that I'm going to be doing. The next one's going to be about nutrition and hydration for the marathon, with the last one being what I'm going to wear. So hopefully you guys check into those as well. Let's get started on pacing. So first I wanna talk about just tools that, to use as you are getting ready for your marathon. So there is a lot available to you. So whenever you are getting ready for your marathon pacing, even if you don't have a coach, there are so many resources. Nobody should be going blind into a marathon, having no idea what to expect in terms of where the hills are going to be or what pace they're going to be starting at. Really the first thing you need to do is have a realistic goal. So once you have that goal pace overall, your finish time, that's going to help you use these tools to your benefit. So for CIM particularly, because it's such a large race, they have some really good tools on their website and you can also find a lot out there, whether it's in forums, because so many people run this race every year. So this year for CIM, they have this amazing video where one of their coaches puts notes on, it drives you through the entire course and gives you pacing strategies. So if you are running CIM, I highly encourage you to do that. I'm gonna put it in a nutshell today and what I plan to do, which is similar to what they suggest. Go into that app, you can go on the CIM website, they'll tell you how to get on there and it's just really, really great advice. Plus, it's just fun to be able to kind of drive the course virtually and just get you really, really excited about what you're gonna be doing. Beyond that, I went into Strava to just get an idea of the overall elevation gain because that's something that's usually not as easy to find, especially when a course is trying to sell themselves as a fast course or a downhill course. So we do know that CIM has a net downhill of 300 feet. Now, when you look at their race course on their website, it's pretty deceiving because it looks like this, you know, little roller hills, but mostly this big drop of downhill when it actually is not very much at all. 300 feet of drop in 26 miles is really hardly anything. And there are also hills within the race. Someone who shows up not knowing that is going to be in for a world of hurt on some of those hills if they have no idea. Ignorance is not bliss in this situation, you guys. So I wanted to have an overall idea of what the elevation gain was going to be as well. So I took to Strava. I was able to find the segment of the California International Marathon. I went through like the first 10 people that were listed there and everyone had something around the five to 700 range for feet of elevation gain. Now everyone is gonna be a little bit different depending on what watch they're using, but I'm pretty confident that around 600 feet of elevation gain is probably what I'm going to be tackling in this race. So that is a great thing to look at if you're unsure about the elevation gain for your particular marathon. Additionally, Find My Marathon is something that I like to use. I looked at their race chart as well, and it looks much more like a flat course instead of a downhill course because it's so much more drawn out. And so I liked looking at that and it gives me a better idea of, okay, this is very, very gradual. And you do see that there are these little hills throughout the race course as well. So for me personally, I run a lot more elevation gain than that in training. I get 600, 700 in maybe 15 miles, 15 to 20. Additionally, I'm gonna be running at sea level coming from Colorado, which is a mile above sea level. So I'm really hoping that will be to my benefit, but we'll just have to see. I'm not gonna to get too excited about that but hopefully it'll be to my benefit. 
So the other tool that I like to use is also from Find My Marathon and they sell these pace bands, but you do not have to buy them. I don't buy it and I don't write a whole bunch of paces on my arm, but it does, does give you a really good idea of just kind of overall pacing and where you wanna be at certain points if you wanna have that negative split, which is the best way to run a race where you're really conservative at, at the start and having more energy to run faster at the end. So I'll talk about, about my specifics in a minute. If you go to find my marathon and you put in your race that you're doing, you put in your goal time, start strategy, I'm gonna be very conservative, which to me is the best way to pace the marathon. And I'm gonna have a negative split. That's the pacing strategy that I want. You can also do aggressive negative split. That put me really fast at the end. I don't think is as realistic. So I like the looks of, looks of this one. I can see that I'm starting out very slow, much slower than my projected 812 pace. So I say, okay, good, that's where I wanna be. I should not be running 812s. You know, it looks like it has me at mile 10 before I'm running faster than that. So I can really think about being conservative for that first third of the race. And then at the half marathon mark, doesn't need to be perfect, but I just think, okay, if I'm around the 148, 149 mark with the half marathon, I'm right where I want to be. And if I run those negative splits, hopefully I will have great energy going to the second half so I can run those negative splits that are my goal. Now, as far as my goal time, I saw you saw I put 335 on here. My PR is in the 333s. I already found out that I got into Boston. So really I wanna go into this race and just have fun and feel strong. If I get a 335, I'd be ecstatic. Honestly, if I even got a 340 just under BQ, I would be happy about that as well. I really have nothing to lose here. I don't need to prove anything. And I'm going to have to start another training cycle for Boston Marathon shortly after this. So I just wanna enjoy the day. All right, so going into how I'm gonna be pacing this marathon specifically and what I'm gonna be thinking about. That first third, think about miles one through eight. I just want to be patient and chill. I'm gonna let my mind wander. I don't wanna to be too focused. I'm gonna be taking it in, looking around me, maybe chatting with someone next to me, taking a photo, because I have this podcast that I love with Tina Muir running for real and she talks to Jared Ward and he talks about you can overuse your energy in your mind just as much as your body early in those early miles. If you're already hyper focused, you're going to wear out your mind. So I'll put that podcast below. I love it. I listen to it before every marathon and I highly recommend it. So in that also is miles six through nine for CIM where they say is the toughest section of the course. So there's a lot of rolling hills, a lot of net climb. So as you move into those miles six through nine, you wanna make sure you are really conservative. There is no point over exerting yourself to stay on pace. You're just going to pay for it later. And that goes for the entire first third. If you are running faster than your goal pace overall, you're going to have a hard time holding on to that in the end. And the best way to run a race is negative splits. You will end up with a faster time. I promise. So really in this section, you wanna practice even effort. So when you're going up those hills, do not look at your watch. I will not be looking at my watch when I'm going uphill because it's just going to stress me out, seeing if I'm getting way off pace when I know that's exactly what should be happening at that time if I'm going even effort because then there's gonna be a downhill for every uphill and I will make up that time. So even effort means that you're going slower on the uphill portions, maybe right at pace when you are on those flat portions and going a little bit faster on those downhill portions. That's what you wanna be thinking about listening to your body. Okay, as we get into the second third of the race, this is all about being in control and feeling smooth. This is what I say to myself. Do you feel in control? Are you feeling smooth? Because if you're not, that's not a good thing. So if you're not feeling in control, get in control by making the pace a little bit slower. So this is really miles nine through 20. I know that's a long time, but this is where you're really having to just focus, but be smooth and be in control. And it's going to start to feel uncomfortable, but it should not be so uncomfortable that it's not manageable. So really think about it staying manageable, especially in you know nine, 10, up until 16 miles. 16 to 20 is where you can start to push a little bit more if you're feeling really, really good. It sounds like after mile 11, you do get some downhill and then it's pretty flat throughout there for the most part with some little rollers here and there. So being able to stay smooth and controlled is a good plan for this portion of the race. 
you get a final climb from mile 19 to 21. So it's really important to be prepared for this going in. I know strategizing ahead of time is going to make me be prepared going into those miles. And in those final four, 22, 26.2, it's gonna be flat, it's gonna be fast. Hopefully that's the goal or it should be. It's still gonna be really, really uncomfortable. This is a marathon and it, of course it's gonna be uncomfortable. My legs are going to be hurting, but you can still be feeling strong and uncomfortable at the same time where you can uh, make your body push through. And just remember guys, your mind gives up before your body does. This is what I remind myself in those late miles when you're so uncomfortable, you have to keep convincing yourself that you can do it. So my mantra, and I've said this before, but the body achieves what the mind believes. And I usually have a mantra like this. And sometimes a new one pops into my head as I'm going along, but I just keep saying this as I go over and over and over. Along the same lines, guys, I would say set up your playlist to be slower the first half, faster the second half, because that music matters. You have that really pump up music at the end, whatever gets you going, that's going to be a good strategy for me to pace it all the way to the end and stay strong. All right, guys, I hope that this was helpful for you, whether you are running CIM or another marathon. If you have any other questions, please pop them below. I'm always happy to answer. I have two more parts of this series coming up where I'm gonna be talking about my nutrition and hydration strategy for the marathon, as well as what I'm going to be wearing to have a great day out there. So tune into those and I will catch you guys in the next one.